pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed my visit here so far. It's been a great opportunity to uh, see old friends and meet some new people, and uh, it's a terrific opportunity to, to, to see all the exciting things going on here. Um, you know, talking about the state of cosmology in Berkeley is a little bit like bringing coals to Newcastle, since this is one of the places that has played such an important role in the development of this field. And it's a really interesting time to be a cosmologist. I mean, since the time I was a graduate student, we've gone from a field which had a tremendous amount of speculation and relatively little data to its current state, where we have a tremendous amount of data. And as I'll try to convey in this talk, we now have a cosmological model that has been remarkably successful. We're at a state where there's a handful of numbers, the age of the universe, the density of matter, the density of atoms, how lumpy the universe is, and how that varies with scale. We can describe all the basic properties of the universe. And a lot of this lecture is just going to be the story of how we got there. And then asking, does that still work? Where do we go from here? In order to do that, I'm going to have to begin by giving you some background. First, I need to teach you special relativity. And that's because astronomy is a historical science. As we look out in space, we look back in time. The key idea to keep in mind is light travels at a finite speed. It takes light a few nanoseconds to get from me to you. So you see me as I was a few nanoseconds ago. And that's no big deal. I don't change that much on that time scale. But the further out you go in space, the further back you go in time. We see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. We see you know, Jupiter as it was 30 minutes ago. You look out to the nearby stars, the typical star in the night sky might be, say, 10 light years away or 20 light years away. A star is 20 light years away. It takes 20 years for light to get from that star to us. So we see it as it was 20 years ago. And that's completely symmetric. If you were on a planet orbiting around a star 20 light years away, you'd see me as I was 20 years ago. And I'd have to pull that ahead. <laughs> and so the further out you go in space, the further back you go in time. We see the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest galaxy to us, as it was two and a half million years ago. When you look out with the Hubble telescope, you see the universe in some of the distant galaxies that they see, as it was 12 billion years ago. And what I'll be talking about today is what we've learned by looking out in space and looking at the microwave background, the leftover heat from the Big Bang, light that has been traveling to us from 13 point, for 13.7 billion years, and seeing what the universe looked like 13.7 billion years ago. So you need to think of us looking out in space back in time. And uh, now that you've learned special relativity, <laughs> it's time you learn general relativity. The special relativity has one key idea. Light moves at a finite speed. For us, general relativity will have two key ideas. Matter tells space how to curve, and the curvature of space tells matter and radiation how to move. And you can see in this picture the sun curving space around it and light coming from a distant star being deflected as it moves around the sun. And what's shown in this picture is actually the first uh, test of general relativity that was done in 1919, as Einstein predicted. And uh, the star A, because of the bending of light, was seen at the position of star B. And this was good enough to make the 1919 issue of the New York Times. And that's, I just love reading this headline. Men of science, and of course it was men of science, back then, more or less a god <laughs> over results of eclipse observation. Einstein theory Triumph stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be, 
but no one need worry. <laughs> so, now that we've established general relativity, you then get to apply it to the universe. When Einstein did that, he found to his surprise that if you took a universe that was uniform, put it into the equations of general relativity, a uniform universe couldn't stay static. A uniform universe in general relativity must either expand or contract. And what Hubble found was that the universe was expanding. Now, this, I think, for many of us, is the conceptually most difficult part of this story. Because most of us have, I'd say, a Galilean notion of space and time. Space is something absolute. What does it mean for space to expand? Um, and we think that it must be expanding into something. And the pictures that you often see are trying to describe this effect is a universe where the distance between galaxies is constantly growing. And when you see this expansion, the picture I like to have is that I want to think about our three-dimensional universe and suppress one dimension. Just think about a two-dimensional version of it. I have a hard time visualizing four dimensions, and I suspect you do as well. So imagine we live on a two-dimensional sheet, and our galaxy is one galaxy on that sheet. You could imagine that you're living on a two-dimensional sheet, or taking that sheet and curving it around to make a sphere like this. So we're living on the surface of the sphere. And when we think about this sphere expanding, it's expanding into the future. So the radial direction is the future. As the universe gets older, the distance between objects grows. You run that back in time, as you move towards the past, objects get closer and closer together. And as you eventually reach this moment here where the sphere collapses down to a point, you get to infinite density, the moment of the Big Bang, and the point at which our understanding breaks down. And it's very tempting to ask, well, if this is the arrow of time, what happened before that moment? And I think the best answer at the moment is we don't know. We have many different ideas. But at this point, they really are mostly speculation. And that's because our knowledge of physics basically breaks down at that point. I like to think of the 20th century having two truly great ideas in physics. General relativity, which you now all understand, and quantum mechanics, and at least the theory of the birth scene. And both of those theories work really well in all of their regimes. They're, but when you try to bring them together here and describe what's happening in the first moments of the Big Bang, our knowledge of physics breaks down. We don't have a successful way of tying those together. String theory represents our current best attempt to do that, but while a very promising idea, it's not yet a successful complete theory, so we don't know how to talk about what happened before this moment. But what we can do is run things forward in time and look at how the universe evolves. We want to look at the properties of the universe. One of the first things you want to ask is what's the global shape of the universe. Should we think of it as a sphere or as an infinite sheet? And we can now apply our basic ideas from general relativity. General relativity says matter tells space how to curve. So if space, the density of matter is very high, space will be very curved. Low, it will be less curved and just balance so that the end total energy of the universe is zero, and the energy in expansion is balanced by the self-gravity of the matter, the geometry of space will be flat, and uh, the geometry that you probably all learned when you were you know, 12 or 13 or 14, that sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees, that geometry is valid, not just on that exam you took years ago, but on the scale of the whole universe. And one of the things we'll talk about is determining the geometry of the universe. Right, so now we're basically ready to talk about the whole picture of cosmology. 
We think about the universe expanding, getting less and less dense with time. As it expands, it gets cooler. So we can run that picture back and think about the evolutionary history of the universe. And we start with a universe that started out 13.7 billion years ago, very hot, very dense, and this hot, dense universe was filled with radiation, filled with heat. As that universe expanded, it cooled. Uh, during a few minutes after the Big Bang started, um, the universe got cool enough that most of the deuterium and helium in the universe formed in those first three minutes. About 500,000 years after the Big Bang, the temperature dropped low enough that electrons and protons combined to make hydrogen. And at that point, the universe became nearly completely neutral. Looking further into the future, about 100 million years, uh, the first stars started to form. And after about a billion years or so, um, galaxies like our own start to really take shape. When we look out in space and back in time, we're looking back to this moment about 500,000 years ago, 500,000 years after the Big Bang, when atoms first formed. And that's because when we had electrons and protons back in the distant past, when the temperature of the universe was above 3,000 degrees, the density of the universe and electrons was so high that it was like a dense fog, and we couldn't see further back. Now, the key, one of the key parts of the story is what we call the cosmic background radiation, the leftover heat from the Big Bang. This was discovered by Penzias and Wilson in the 60s, and for those of you who were around before cable television, you have probably all observed the cosmic background radiation. Because if you switched your TV between channels, about 2% of the static that you saw on your TV was cosmic background radiation, leftover heat from the Big Bang. Those of you who were born post-cable, when you switched your radio between stations, a lot of that static on your uh, FM radio is uh, leftover heat from the Big Bang, a couple percent. So you've at least heard the microwave background. So it fills space. Um, it's nearly perfectly uniform. And it was with the Kobe experiment that cosmologists were first able to detect tiny variations at the level of one part in 100,000 in variations in temperature and density of the universe. And these tiny variations are very interesting because they are showing what the universe looked like in its first moments. In many ways, they represent the universe's baby picture. And as a physicist, they're terrific things to study because the universe back then was really simple. I want to describe the universe today, or even stars and galaxies today. It's very complicated, nonlinear physics. We have to worry about complexities like magnetic fields and turbulence, and it's hard. The great thing about studying the early universe is it was simple, particularly back about 500,000 years after the Big Bang. The universe was just a dense plasma of electrons and protons and some of the dark matter that fills the universe. And what we see in these fluctuations are basically sound waves in this plasma. And by observing the properties of these sound waves, we can learn a tremendous amount about the basic properties of the universe. The fact that there was so much information there is what motivated us um, now about 17 years ago to propose to build the uh, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or WMAP, which we named after my colleague Dave Wilkinson after he passed away. And the goal of this mission was to go out and to map in more detail the microwave background, to go out and really map this transition from when the universe went from ionized and neutral, to look at the sound waves, and to see what we saw. <coughs> So now let me describe what we've emerged from that step. And this is the data we took with WMAP. This is a map of the whole sky around us. The red stuff in the center is emission from electrons and dust in our galaxy. 
If I was wearing the hat of a galactic astronomer, I'd say this red stuff is the interesting stuff. But as a cosmologist, I'm interested in these fluctuations down here and up there, the stuff that's not coming from the galaxy. In order to separate that out, we want to go to higher frequencies, and here's a map at a higher frequency. You can see the galaxy, the Milky Way, is not as bright here. Going to higher frequencies, it becomes dimmer, and then dimmer, and dimmer. We can combine that multi-frequency data and make a clean map of what the microwave sky looks like. And we can see the patterns of hot and cold spots, tiny variations in temperature um, that reflect um, the, these sound waves in the early universe. And these variations are a few millionths of a degree from place to place. So these are, are, are tiny fluctuations that we were able to map. And what we're seeing here is the initial conditions for the emergence of galaxies across the whole sky. And what we can do is take these observations and try to figure out what they're telling us both about the early universe and the, prop and, uh, the evolution, subsequent evolution of the universe. The way we do that is we study their statistical properties. We basically throw circles down on the map and ask, What's the average temperature fluctuation there? Now, this circle I happen to throw around a very particular spot where there happens to be the letter SH. And this may tell us many things. Um, I first noticed this when I went to a talk at UC Davis. And Stephen Hawking was speaking. <laughs> and he had a big image behind him like this. And I thought his students had introduced into the map as a joke. <laughs> but then I had the data on my laptop, so I looked at it and it's there. So maybe there is some profound message. And this was back in 2003, so another interpretation was that was Saddam Hussein's initials. <laughs> you know, and another theory I had is that, well, we had to remove a lot of galaxies here, and maybe we missed out and, and didn't see the I and T. And, uh, <laughs> but, but mostly, I think it tells us that um, we evolved to find patterns, whether they're there or not. And our ancestors um, had to worry about things like, say, tigers in the woods. And our ancestors are probably all jumping. And nine times out of ten, they jumped when there's a t they saw something, and it turned out not to be a tiger. But one time out of ten, they jumped a little earlier and got away. And you know those calm ancestors, those calm people who didn't jump? Well, they got eaten by the tiger, and they're not our ancestors. And this may be why we're all a little jumpy, a little too nervous sometimes, um, and certainly why we're good at forming patterns. And because we're so good at forming patterns and finding patterns, we have to be careful in our statistical analysis and develop tools that let us extract the information from the data. And the basic tool we use is we ask how lumpy the universe is as a function of scale. We draw down circles of different sizes, average on those different scales, and measure that lumpiness versus scale. And I'm going to show a bunch of plots like this because this is what our data looks like, and it's a measure of how lumpy the universe is as a function of angular scale. And we plot it this way in units of one over angle. But this basically says the characteristic size of those hot and cold lumps in the picture is about one degree. And we see degree size lumps in the sky. And we see some lumpiness on smaller scales. And you'll notice there's some characteristic patterns here. This is of a, a sine wave-like pattern. And that's due to the fact that we're seeing sound waves in the early universe. So we can learn a lot by looking at these patterns. The first thing we can learn is just the geometry of the universe. We know we're seeing sound waves. We know the universe is about, more precisely, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang when we're looking at this. So we know the characteristic distance of each of these hot and cold spots is about 380,000 light years. It's about how far the sound wave can move. So nature is holding up a ruler to us. 
we know the length of the ruler. We measure the angle. If I know the length of one side of a triangle, I know the angle, I can measure the lengths of the other sides of the triangle. I've just figured out how long, how far the light has traveled. That tells me how old the universe is. So by measuring this angle, that translates, basically, into a measure of the age of the universe. And we now know that the age of the universe is about 13.75 billion years, with an uncertainty of about a percent. And that's because we've made very accurate measurements of these angles. We can also look at this pattern and measure things like how the sound wave behaves. And by measuring the ratio of this peak to this peak, that gives us a measurement of the density of atoms. We can also infer the density of matter and the basic properties of the fluctuations. Once I've made those measurements, I know what the initial conditions are. I've basically taken the universe's baby picture. And what I like to do is, thinking about this, is I've taken the pictures of a bunch of babies, and these are three randomly selected babies. <laughs> and if you know the initial conditions, you can run this forward in time. And as a parent who's done this experiment, it doesn't work that accurately. When you study children, it's pretty hard to extrapolate from what they were like at three days to what they're like today. Um, but, uh, you know, it does work, oops, with the early universe. What we can do is take the fluctuations we see in the microwave sky, use it to predict the statistical properties of the early universe, how lumpy it was versus scale. Then put it in the computer, and you see a computer simulation cycling that shows how these initial fluctuations we see grow to be the large-scale structure we see today. And we can then take large surveys of where the galaxies are, things like the Slow Digital Sky Survey, and measure how lumpy they are today and compare that to our observations. And to me, one of the remarkable successes of cosmology is we can measure this lumpiness versus scale. One of the great things about cosmologists, you get to use really big numbers. So our smallest scale is a trillion times the mass of the sun, and we're gonna go up to 10 to the 22 times the mass of the sun. And this is a measure of lumpiness versus scale, where the black points come from our microwave background observations, the blue points from our surveys of galaxies, and um, you know, we get to smaller scales. The magenta points here are from uh, work done by Euro Seljak and his group, Euros is here, on how lumpy things are on smaller scales. And the dash curve is our theoretical model. And, you know, if I was giving this talk uh, two years ago, my conclusion would be this simple model works remarkably well. We start with general relativity, a few basic ingredients, and all the pieces fit together. It's consistent with the supernova measurements, uh, work done here, measurements of the Hubble constant, the age of the universe, properties of clusters, elements produced in the universe, early universe, lensing, and so on. And um, that's where we were two years ago. But the great thing about science is data continues to improve, and you get to test your models. So as we move from Colby to WMAP, and now we're going to move on to results from the European Space Agency's Planck satellite that just came out in March and see what they tell us. And uh, also talk a bit about some of the results from the ground. <coughs> So this is what I've shown you so far. The data from WMAP showing how lumpy things are versus scale. But I cut my plot off over here. And that's because that's where the data ended. But the nice thing about our model of how the sound waves behave in the early universe is that model predicts that the, a very particular pattern of what the fluctuation should look like at smaller scales. So what we've done in the last several years is improve our data on the smaller scales, and see, we're now going to see how, what we found. First, I'm going to talk about data from uh, Chile, from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, and here's a picture of the telescope in the, uh, northern Chile. Um, 
The ACT telescope is led by my colleague Lyman Page at Princeton. Right next door to it, on the scale of this map, it's just kind of a same thing, is the Polar Bear Telescope, which is led by folks here, which is also mapping the sky, uh, the same, making these detailed maps. I think of it as taking this picture I showed from WMAP and zooming in and mapping the detailed pictures on smaller scales. And uh, also some data from my, our colleagues at the South Pole who are, have been mapping the sky using the South Pole Telescope. And this is where things were uh, in, say, January. And here's the model. The points show the data from the South Pole and from Chile. And you can see things are looking pretty good. <laughs> And not only did we see the first three peaks that we observed in WMAP, but these smaller scale experiments have now mapped enough of the sky with high precision to see five additional peaks. Uh, the model, with no additional parameters, continues to fit the data. And this is why with, we were excited to see what would come out when the European Planck satellite reported its results in March and map the whole sky at high precision. When the data came out, the first thing one noticed is on large scales, it looked remarkably similar to the earlier data. This plot above is from the WMAP data I showed. The plot below is the Planck data. And at this resolution and sitting in this room, you probably can't tell the difference between them. Um, the amplitude here is about 1.2% higher. Um, that's probably some normalization issues here. But um, it looks broadly similar. Now, the Planck data I'm showing here is the clean maps. The raw data, uh, you know, what had to worry about removing the galaxy. This is the Planck map the sky at nine frequencies. And with these nine frequencies, you're able to do a very good job removing the contribution of the galaxy. And one of the important features of the Planck data that you can't see in, until you kind of zoom in on it is Planck had the resolution to see a lot of these small-scale features. And you can compare what Planck saw to what we measured from the ground. And here's the Planck results on a patch of the sky. And here's what we measured from the ground and at a, one frequency. And here's the same at another. And, you know, they all seem to agree quite nicely. And at first glance, this all looks great. And this plot shows the lumpiness of the universe versus scale. The blue points, what we measured from WMAP over the past nine years, and the, the red and green points, the ground-based measurements, and the black points, the most recent measurements from Planck. And it seems that this model is all fitting. But if you look closely, you're going to start to see some of the things that have worried me over the past four months. Um, you'll notice out here, the black points consistently low. The shape isn't quite the same. And when we look at the basic parameters, and I'm going to do something that I always tell my students never to do, which is put up a table in a talk. But this is what we actually measure and do. And one of the things I want to get talk about in the next five to ten, ten minutes of my talk is, um, so what I personally have done over the last four months, because I want to convey what kind of grabs you sometimes as a scientist and makes you worry and uh, kind of drives you to think about things. And these were measurements of these basic parameters of the universe. The, how the fluctuation varied with scale, how much matter there is, how many atoms there are, how fast the universe is expanding. And the numbers are pretty similar, so, but they're not the same. We had measured a value of about close to 70 for the expansion rate of the universe. And we've measured, you know, with the new data, it shifted. Now, this is a, one hand looks like a modest shift, but it shifted, as I'll show in a way, in which cosmology no longer seemed to fit together. 
One way to see this is these are measurements from the Planck team, where in red, there's a plot showing what they measured from looking at the early universe, from the microwave background spectrum, and what they measured from looking at clusters. And what's plotted here is one axis is how lumpy the universe is, and the other is how much matter there is. And the thing you should note is that the two curves no longer overlap. Right? Everything, when the errors were bigger, everything seemed to fit together. Our data's gotten better, and things don't seem to fit. And when something like this happens, there's really three possibilities. There's something wrong with the red data. There's something wrong with the blue data. There's something wrong with your model. And the most interesting one is when there's something wrong with your model. Because that means there's new physics here. There's something missing in our understanding of the universe. And, you know, this is, that's, of course, the most exciting possibility. Um, and as you might expect, the people who worked on the data in the red said the problem is with the data in the blue, that astronomers don't know how to measure anything accurately, and uh, there's something systematic there. But what worried me was that that wasn't the only discrepancy. Oops. Um, so here are measurements of the expansion rate. And in red was the measurements from the microwave sky. And the WMAP measurements, they were pretty consistent with the work that Adam Reese and his group did with Cepheids, and Wendy Friedman and her group did at Carnegie. And you can see some of them have big errors, but the most precise measurements from the ground of the expansion rate of the universe, those top two blue points, are starting to get pretty inconsistent with that red point. And, you know, Things sort of overlapped around here before, but as the data improved and seemed to shift that way, it also suggested another discrepancy. And, uh, you know, this starts to get worrying. And uh, you start looking at more ground-based data. And this purple curve here are measurements of the abundance, based on the abundance of clusters of the density of matter and the lumpiness of the universe. And this is based on observations of counting of the number of clusters we see and weighing them with gravitational lensing. And again, you know, this overlapped nicely with our bigger error bars from WMAP, but as the data improved from Planck, things didn't fit. So, you know, having spent about 15 years of my life thinking about the WMAP data, I decided I really ought to dig in to the Planck data and see what's going on. And uh, started looking quite carefully at their 500 pages of papers that were written. And started to notice that there are some intriguing discrepancies where, you know, there are features that too many data points deviated from lines, from the models and ways, and self-consistency checks didn't work. So I decided, working together with two postdocs in Princeton, uh, Rene Lazek and Raphael Flaubert, to take the data and redo things. Uh, one of the very important things we do now in astronomy, as a standard practice, is data is made publicly available. So we made well, our, our experiment, all our data public. The Planck team released all their data. Anyone in the world can download the data and check. And I think this is a really important feature in science. You know, this data was taken, you know, one hand was taken with public money, so it belongs to everyone. But there's also, you know, another piece of that is this data is there for everyone to check. They made all their data available, they made their codes available. When you have very complicated code, if you've ever read someone else's code, it's not always easy to use if it's made available. Um, Renee was very brave, much braver than I was, and she went through and understood the basic code and rewrote the likelihood and just rewrote the whole basic structure. And Raphael and I redid the analysis of how lumpy things were versus scale, redid things. We started to notice some interesting things. So one thing, we said, let's just take the one most problematic channel, the one that didn't fail, that failed the 
consistency checks in the paper and remove it. And just, just rerun things without the problematic channel. And if you'll notice, all of a sudden, all the numbers start to agree <coughs> remarkably well with the previous values. All the shifts are driven by that one problematic channel. So he then said, let's take the data from that problematic channel and reanalyze it and do it in a way when we no longer assume that measurements of the sky taken at the same time by two different detectors are independent. So what I think is the key problem with their data is they're scanning the sky taking images with, different, with many different detectors, and they're assuming each detector is independent of the other. But each, all those detectors are sitting in the same cooler, and they're sitting on the same satellite, exposed to the same environmental changes. And I think those environmental changes are producing subtle correlated effects of their math. So we did our analysis where we said, what happens if we just only use data that was taken at different times? We do that, our values shift. <laughs> and everything goes back to the previous values. We no longer have these discrepancies. The curve now shifts to this purple curve. And all of a sudden, there's nice overlap regions where our ground-based data and our space-based data agree. And we seem to have a consistent cosmology. So this is where I think we are at the moment. On the theoretical side, we have a successful model with possible deviations. Big open questions. Why is the universe accelerating today? Why the universe accelerate in the past? And what's the dark matter? On the observational side, I think we're in an interesting state. Um, this, of course, is my view of what's going on with the data. Um, I've spoken about this. I gave this talk in Cambridge a couple of uh, months ago. Um, a bit more hostile audience, leadership of the Planck team, the city of the front um, They had questions. Um, but, you know, I think the important thing is we're going to be able to resolve this because data is improving. So Planck has actually mapped the sky not just twice, but now five times. And they've not yet released those five that, when they've gone over five times, but now with five independent maps, we'll be able to resolve this. Um, I'm looking forward with great excitement to the next Planck release, which will probably be in June, at which point they'll release all their data and will re release their improved analysis. And one of two things will happen. Either we're right that there's some systematic and the things are still consistent, um, which in one way would be satisfying, because it's nice to right, I'm wrong. But um, I actually think it would be more exciting if there is a problem, because that would tell us there's something new and would point to new directions to move up and new things we need to understand about the field. At the same time things are progressing in space, there's a lot of progress happening on the ground. Um, the South Pole Telescope has been mapping the sky now with polarization. We've been mapping it with our experiment in Chile. The Polar Bear Telescope has been making polarization maps. Within the next year, the first precision polarization measurements on small scales will be made public. And there will be analyses done, and these will provide an independent look at what's going on. And these, you know, they will have the precision to see, is there a discrepancy there? Is there something going on? Another thing we're all looking for is can we find ways of learning more about the universe? So far, our measurements of temperature, these temperature fluctuations have told us that we see patterns of fluctuations that are consistent with the idea that fluctuations were generated a few moments after the Big Bang during a period of very rapid expansion called inflation. One of the predictions of inflation is 
the, a pattern of gravitational waves that will fill the universe. And these should predict a distinctive pattern in the microwave cycle. One of the things that I was very much looking forward to this year is the spider experiment. Uh, a balloon-borne experiment was supposed to be launched from the South Pole and map the sky and look for patterns of polarization and I think had the best chance of the current generation of experiments of detecting gravitational waves in the first moment. Sadly, because of all the nonsense in Washington, that they canceled all operations in Antarctica. And Antarctica is on a very tight schedule. You have to ship things down there. You have to, um, without money to pay the contractors, the experiments can. So, uh, you know, it appears, I haven't read, checked the news today in detail, that, you know, we won't default, the government will continue. But one of the losses we've already experienced has been lost. Um, it, we will recover, it'll come a year or two later, but we've wasted a lot of money and time when we could have had a good chance of seeing these gravitational waves. You know, that said, there's still a lot of exciting things coming. So let me conclude. I tried to convey today a couple different sets of ideas. One, is to give you a sense of this successful model that has been building up really since Einstein's early work of cosmology. A model that starts with general relativity and uh, a uniform universe and lives to the Big Bang. And in this Big Bang universe, the density of the universe determines its evolution in phase. And I hope to convey how we've been able to use the microwave background to make fundamental observations of the universe's property determine things like the total density of the universe by measuring the characteristic size of hot and cold spots, come up with a model that has strange composition, atoms making up only 4% of the universe, the rest in the form of dark matter and dark energy, but a model that's been mostly successful. I hope to convey the sense that as data improves, interesting things can happen. Discrepancies can arise. I don't think we know yet whether these discrepancies are pointing to problems with the Planck data, problems with our astronomical data on the physics. But I hope I've left you with a sense that we are fortunate to live in exciting times. That we're at a moment where a year from now we'll know more. Our data will improve and we will have a deeper understanding of the universe we live in. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you, David. That was a fascinating talk. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, so, uh, on fixing those detector um, defects, did the, did the consistent departure on small scales of the fluctuation angular size graph, did they change? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't have a plot here, but when we redo it, the points go very nicely to the bottom. Um, the, there were two features. One, about 1800, that was a dip. And that dip goes away completely. And the other one, the points come nicely back down to the line. So it's, it suggests, it, it has the feel of something right. Right. Yeah, Charles? In the current issue of Scientific American on gravitational waves, you're quoted as... <laughs> <laughs> giving some comments about uh, using atoms to further back in time. Could you expand on that point? Uh, I think what I said, not sure. This is on, was I talking on uh, microwave backgrounds or on Lisa? I don't remember what I was quoting. Lisa. 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 Okay. So um, I get emailed a lot, and I got voice I try to say sensible things, but I think I know what I said. Um, yeah. So let me just step back and say a little bit about gravitational waves. The history of astronomy has basically been, as we had new ways of looking at the universe, we discovered new things. When 
Galileo built the first optical telescope to look at pointed towards the Jupiter. He discovered it was a new instrument to discover gravity. Much of 20th century astronomy has been the story of opening up new wavelength bands. When we opened up the microwave band, we discovered the microwave background, leftover heat from the Big Bang. We opened up the X-ray band, we launched satellites into space. Astronomers discovered black holes, observed neutron stars, opened up the radio band, pulsars, whole new bursts of discovery. So every time we've opened up a new wavelength band, we've made a new discovery. What, um, we've now opened up mostly electromagnetic spectrum. What many of us think is one of the really promising things to do in the 21st century is to start to explore the universe using gravitational waves. When you have rapid variations in how matter is distributed, that generates gravitational waves. Recall, recall your basic general relativity. Matter tells space how to curve. Well, if you move the matter around, the curvature of space is going to fluctuate. So if I have, say, two neutron stars rapidly orbiting around each other, they're going to send out gravitational waves. If you have a pair of black holes orbiting around each other, they'll send out gravitational waves. There are a bunch of different techniques for detecting gravitational waves. One I've mentioned already in the context of this talk. If we want to detect gravitational waves whose wavelengths are comparable to the visible universe, the best way to do that is to use the microwave sky as a large gravitational wave detector. And that's what we hope to do with these balloon flights, some of these ground-based experiments looking for gravitational waves generated in the early universe. We also hope to detect gravitational waves from things like black holes spiraling around each other. These are much smaller scale things, so they'll generate gravitational waves <coughs> whose wavelengths are smaller, maybe the size of the, arc, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Um, and some even smaller, maybe a few kilometers across. Right now, there are two important efforts to look for them. One is already going on now called LIGO. That's a series of uh, lasers and tunnels measuring how gravitational waves move masses around. Uh, LIGO is being operated now. One of my predictions for important astronomical discoveries in the next five years is I think we will make the first detections of gravitational waves from black holes to light. And that's going to be a really exciting field that I think will open up soon. I think I was quoted on LISA, which is a planned mission that will be launched in space. LISA will look for much more massive black holes, like those that sit in the center of galaxies, spiraling together. And LISA will have the sensitivity to uh, detect these gravitational waves. And there are a couple different approaches to how we might do these detections in space. Most involve flying a scaled up version of the ground based experiment. You have lasers in space, a constellation. Other ideas, and one of the things I've done is work with colleagues on possible ways of doing this, is to use an atomic laser effectively, an atomic interferometer, rather than an optical interferometer. But either way, the goal is to detect these gravitational waves from black hole and spirals. Um, there's a possibility that these detectors might also detect gravitational waves from the early universe. But if our current ideas about the properties of the early universe are correct, we are more likely to see it through our observations from microwave background, from experiments like those in, in Chile or in Antarctica. Although, yeah, Jeff, you know, how far back in time can we probe the universe, and what methods are used? So we can probe, we're always probing back, because the universe is about 13.75 billion years old. It's always a back that far as as far as you can go. The most, the furthest back we can look directly today is the microwave background. That's giving us a picture of 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We have indirect ways of looking further back in time. Most of the deuterium and helium in the universe was, were produced three minutes after the Big Bang. You can think of them as fossils. 
so astronomers can measure the abundance of deuterium and helium. And by measuring their abundances, infer what happened during the first few minutes. We can go even further back in time by looking at other fossils. As most of you have probably noticed, this room is filled mostly with matter, not with antimatter. There's no one in this room, who, fortunately, who's made up of anti-hydrogen. Because if we were to shake their hands, it would violently explode. We would destroy all the Berkeley. Um, why is our universe filled with mostly matter rather than antimatter? That's something we think was determined in the first microsecond. So the fact that we have matter in the universe is actually a, a fossil telling us about things further back in time. The fossil that we can look at furthest back in time, potentially, are these gravitational waves that I alluded to. These gravitational waves, if our theory of inflation is correct, were produced about 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang. So by observing them, we can look back to incredibly early moments and probe physics at scales that we have no other way of studying. It's one of the reasons many of us are so excited about the possibility of making those kinds of observations. Yeah? So, uh, David, uh, everybody here has heard a lot about dark energy. Mm -hmm. And as you know better than anybody, there are lots of experiments being planned and even carried out to measure the properties of dark energy. Uh, let me offer you the question, what are our prospects in the next decade or two of learning the nature of dark energy? Um, well, first let me just back up and say a little bit about dark energy. I uh, tried to cover a lot, so didn't go into detail about what's going on with it. Most of our universe, here's our composition, isn't atoms, isn't even the dark matter that makes up galaxies. Most of the universe is energy that fills empty space, what we call dark energy. Um, the simplest idea for dark energy is that it's just empty space itself has a net energy associated with all that. We don't have a good theoretical understanding of why it has the value it has. Though, if Rafael Busso was here, he would argue with me. But um, <laughs> I uh, think most of us don't think so. Um, and we'd like to understand this, because whatever this is, it is telling us about the nature of empty space itself. Now, how can we hope to learn more about it? Well, one of the properties of dark energy is it affects how space evolves, right? You've all learned general relativity. Energy and matter tell space how to curve. So by measuring how space evolves with time, to measure how the expansion rate of the universe versus time, tells us about the properties of dark energy. A lot of us feel the fact that, you know, 72% <laughs> of the universe is in a form that we don't understand at all, it's a pretty fundamental problem. <laughs> so, uh, there are a bunch of different approaches happening to measuring the properties of dark energy. One of the ones that's being led here by Dave Schlegel up at um, LBL is an experiment called DAISY, which will measure the distribution, how galaxies are distributed. Measure how lumpy the universe is versus scale. Actually make use of something I talked about in this talk, which is um, the fact that we have these sound waves produced in the early universe. And these sound waves imprint the characteristic scale on the universe. We have the universe holding up that ruler to us. And I talked about this in the context from my way back. Then. We measure these hot and cold spots, and that tells us the distance to, to the universe back then. Well, we can use that ruler not just back then, but in more recent times, by measuring the distances to galaxies. And by charting the galaxy distances, that will let us um, figure out what the dark energy has been doing, how the universe has been expanding, say, in the last five, six billion years. We'd like to go further back in time and measure the distances to galaxies that are further away. What makes that challenging is the further back you go in time, light gets redshift and you start to need to work in the infrared. That's challenging. Our atmosphere emits a lot in the infrared, and it's hard to do that from the ground. So if you want to study the early universe, the 
we need to go to space and build a telescope in the infrared. This is why one of the things that the uh, astronomy community felt was a very high priority for the next decade is to build a wide field infrared telescope to look for and study the dark energy. And that telescope will measure the distance, this distance effect um, <coughs> you, uh, using galaxies. It will also measure how the lumpiness of the universe evolves. Your general relativists, you know that matter tells space how to curve. So by seeing how light's deflected as it moves, we can measure the lumpiness of the universe and how it evolves with time. So by making accurate measurements of galaxy properties and seeing how they're distorted as they propagate towards us, we can learn about how this lumpy space is and how that evolves with time. So we want to build a, a wide field infrared telescope to do that as well. Now, this has been a story that's been going on for a while. Um, astronomers really for over a decade have been trying to figure out ways to get this built. We had a very fortunate event about oh, a little more than a year ago, in fact, maybe close to 18 months ago. Um, 18 months ago, well, it came public about 14 months ago. But 18 months ago, I got a phone call from a guy named John Grunsfeld. He's the guy who fixed the Hubble. Um, for those of you who see the movie, um, I strongly recommend seeing the movie Gravity. It's really stunning. Um, as an astronomer, I found the orbital dynamics a little disturbing. <laughs> I, was, uh, I had a problem with the suspension of disbelief. Um, my daughter got, well, I won't say <laughs> My daughter had a problem with who died in the movie. Where is I going with this? John Brunsfeld. John Brunsfeld is the guy who actually did what uh, Sandra Bullock does in the movie. John Brunsfeld is the guy who fixed the hope. And John's now head of science at NASA. And John called me up and said, we just got a 2.4 meter telescope, that's a Hubble, telescope the size of Hubble, from the National Reconnaissance Organization. Um, do you think it would be useful? And uh, it also turns out, unlike, it's much better than Hubble, it has 200 times the field of view. So every time you take an image, you get an image 200 times the size of Hubble. So, uh, you know, the answer, this is one of these questions that wasn't that hard to answer. But we, one of the things I've been engaged in with other members of the astronomy community is thinking about how can we best make use of it. And this seems like a great opportunity for astronomy. Because we can do, I think, a fundamentally three very interesting things. We can use it to understand the properties of dark energy, make very precise measurements. We can use it, as we use Hubble, to study the universe as a whole. But now we have 200 times the field of view, so we can do the kind of general astronomy that Hubble has done so powerfully and take a step beyond it. And it's also, as, as you know, a very powerful telescope for studying the properties of, of planets, and to do that in two ways. One, through studying planet demographics, the same kind of gravitational lensing that we can use to study dark matter, we can use to study planets, because planets are kind of dark matter as far as, in some ways, they don't emit light. Uh, and they curve space and they affect things. You can count the number of planets at the edges of solar system, planets out by the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn through lensing. And we'll also be able to put an instrument on it called a coronagraph and use this to um, characterize planets and begin the process. Not so much yet, I think we don't have the sensitivities, to characterize Earth-like planets around nearby stars, to get very lucky. But start to distinguish whether there were planets with properties like Jupiter or Uranus, and start to characterize their atmospheres, and take some of the next steps in this field. So it, I, it looks like we will have, um, I hope, an opportunity to take sort of the step beyond Hubble with this and, uh, and uh, make important steps forward. Um, do you see any, uh, I've heard of, of attempts of native using uh, 
gravitational waves to try to find out, explore what preceded the, the, the black hole singularity. Uh, is, is Lisa involved in that or? Uh, yeah, so one of the, just like your, no, no, I think one of the things that we all hope will happen with gravitational waves is learn more about what happens when a black hole forms. Which we'll actually see as it starts, as they collide together, what's emitted. No, I mean be, before the Big Bang. Oh, before sorry. the Big Bang. I, I, oh, must, sorry. I must have misspoke. Um, potentially. Okay, so there are several different ideas of what was before the Big Bang. One idea is time starts with the Big Bang. And this is that asking what's before the Big Bang is like asking what's north of the North Pole. That's just what you can't. There's, the question doesn't make sense. That's what time began. That's one answer. Okay, God. Another answer is, but another to this question is, well, we told that the universe could be expanding or contracting. They're both solutions. So there's a model called the cyclic model, in which our universe has undergone a series of cycles. Collapse to the uh, singularity, expansion again, perhaps collapse in the future. And our universe has undergone many cycles like that. One of the interesting features of the cyclic model is it provides a different way of generating fluctuations. In the cyclic model, the fluctuations that we see in the microwave sky, the fluctuations of blue form galaxies, were generated as the universe collapsed and there was a very slow period of collapse. In the inflationary model, one that most people uh, at the moment prefer, but we don't really have a definitive proof of this. The universe it generated those fluctuations through a very rapid period of early expansion. The inflationary model predicts gravitational waves. The inflationary model is uh, right, we should see the gravitational waves. If the cyclic model is right, that suggests that there was this time before the Big Bang where the universe was collapsing, we shouldn't see gravitational waves. So, you know, one of the things when a uh, uh, spider, you know, finally does get to fly, or if one of the ground-based experiments or Planck has the sensitivities to see it, we detect gravitational waves, that would tell us that the cyclic model is not right. At least that's not the right thing. So, uh, it wouldn't, uh, you know, with models of the very early universe, it's difficult to kind of prove them. We really disprove them. But we would learn a lot about what was before the Big Bang, what was going on by the first time. So, one quick question. That's the last one. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get a quick answer. <laughs> Is the dark matter and dark energy dark because we're not looking at the right frequency? And, and the second question is, are, are there any practical applications on the Earth? Um, I can actually give short answers to that. Um, the dark matter, when we talk about observing the dark matter being dark, it really means it doesn't interact with photons, it doesn't interact with light. We have very good constraints on how dark dark matter is. As light from stars or galaxies move through it, it doesn't interact with matter. It doesn't interact with dark matter. And dark matter also doesn't interact with protons or neutrons. We know whatever the dark matter is, it must interact electromagnetically extremely weakly. So it doesn't matter what frequency we're looking at, we know it's, it has very weak interactions, if at all. So it's, it's very dark. The same is true of the dark energy. Um, practical applications? Well, since we don't know what it is, we don't know how to use it. <laughs> um, we, you know, we really don't know. And I'll end with a, a, a story of Maxwell, which I think is not true, but it's a good story. <laughs> Supposedly Maxwell explained the theory of electromagnetism um, at a meeting of the Royal Society to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Chancellor asked him, is this electricity study good for anything? And Maxwell answered, his thing, he doesn't know, but his grandson will figure out, figure it out, and the Chancellor's grandson will pass it. <laughs>